How's it going, Mark? Good, how are you? Doing well. My name's Seth Martin. This is uh, Mark Dysinger, owner and operator of Playoffs Feet Charters, based out of Killingworth, Connecticut. Um, to start, I just want to kind of take it way back to the very beginning. If you want to tell us a little bit how you first got into fly fishing. Oh, um, wow. Maybe who taught you, how old yeah. you were, where you were. That's a great story. So um, I've been fishing since I could walk. It was my dad. I've been fly fishing since I was about seven. And my dad was not a fly fisherman, but he supported the interest in that. Yeah. And it just was a vortex that sucked me right in. When other kids were out there, you know, I was thinking about fishing. I'd be in church, I'm thinking about fishing, you know, it just sucked me right in. And then at 12 years of age, I got a rudimentary basic fly tie kit. So that was another whole component about that. Oh, yeah. So it, it's, it's been a very long time. And um, I grew up in Maine. A lot of cold water fisheries, trout, landlocked salmon, smallmouth bass, and the coast, striped bass, mackerel, bluefish. And I grew up two blocks from Casco Bay in South Portland, so it's two blocks from the ocean. So I had it, I had it pretty good. Yeah. It was really, really good. And um, I'm not a fly fishing purist by any means, but it is my favorite way to fish, and at times it's the most effective way to fish. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Um, we love hearing. You know, the father-son journeys about getting out on the water. Yeah. Um, I read that you obviously primarily fished in New England salt most of the time. Yes. I guess how much saltwater fly fishing did you do compared to fresh water and how would you compare those two? Oh, well, I, I would say it's about 75, 25, 75% 75 salt water. Okay. Um, and that's just because with the time I have available, that's what I prefer to do. Yeah. Comparing the two, if someone's going from salt to fresh, I think that's an easier transition than going from fresh to salt because uh, I think people who do a lot of freshwater fishing, particularly trout fishing with delicate presentations and very fine tippets, I think people underestimate how much pressure you can put on a strong fish with fly gear. I, yeah. I, I think they're a little too delicate sometimes and uh, for a trout angler, a 30 foot cast might be a long cast and there's not a lot of double hauling experience and if you want to have success in salt water or large predator fish in freshwater you have to be able to double haul you have to be able to shoot line into your back cast and your forward cast there's almost always wind of some sort super glass calm mornings just don't happen that often so there's always that challenge um, but the fish in the ocean tend to run bigger and stronger yeah. And uh, they present a different challenge because fresh water, the fish are within a given area. In the ocean, you have to know the tides, you have to know the time of year, you have to know the water temperature, the bait and everything to give yourself the best opportunity to come across those fish. So pluses and minuses of each. Yeah, 100%. And you mentioned um, people think you could put less pressure with fly gear. I guess that's compared to conventional gear, obviously, which you mentioned that you had done a little bit growing up. Um, I guess, how would you compare and contrast, you know, conventional fishing compared to fly fishing, especially in something with a little bit harsher environment, such as the salt water and these bigger, more powerful <coughs> fish? That's a very good question. Um, spinning gear has its advantages. A lot of times you are more limited by spinning gear than you are with fly fishing gear. And some people think that that's actually all the way around. Spinning gear, a lot of times when we're using lures with that, you have to keep the lure constantly moving. You can't stop it and pause it unless it's an unweighted soft plastic or it's gonna move and sink to the bottom. Uh, sometimes they're too flashy, sometimes they're too big. In the fly fishing, when saltwater fish are on small shrimp or crab to really small bait fish, there aren't lures made small enough to mimic those with fly fishing can, and it's a more delicate presentation. And in general, I kind of liken it to hunters. Spinning rod is like a rifle. Whereas fly fishing is like bow hunting. You, you, you have to be a little bit more in tune with the environment. You have to be a little bit closer sometimes. And it's not doing it because it's harder. It's doing it many times because it's more effective than spin fishing. Many, many times. Yeah. Of course, the opposite can be true. You know, when it's really windy or when you're in a, the fish are down 50 feet of water, you know, you're not touching with a fly, so, yeah. but. I complete. I love that comparison, you know, to hunting with the rifle versus archery. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just a lot more delicate, I would say, in a way, but you have to be more in tune with your surroundings and nature. Um, going back to, you mentioned, obviously, getting your first vice at 12-year-old or tying kit. Uh, did you begin by tying these saltwater flies? And uh, I guess, were you making up your own patterns at that 
at that age or did you have somebody you would watch and kind of learn from? So how did that develop? That's another great question. I had no formal training. I just did and of course I overdressed everything. Used way too many materials, no sense of proportion. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, it came in fits and spurts. Like I would finally get the hang of something, then I'd find a new material. Um, our pet dog, I was picking hair up from the pet dog, tied to a hook. And it wasn't until probably eight to 10 years into it that I actually followed a recipe. That's when the clouds are minnows really starting to boom outside of the Susquehanna River and into salt water. So I'm like, okay, and of course I overdressed the fly. But you start to learn a sense of proportion. And although I have tied tiny flies, like trout flies, dries and nymphs and stuff like that. Now the smallest hook that I tie is a size six for bonefish flies, yeah. which is giant in some situations compared to trout fishing. But um, I think it was easier for me. And when I teach fly tying classes, I do the same thing. I tie saltwater patterns because it's easier to get the sense of proportion. You can see what you're doing on something that's much, much larger. Yeah. You can get the idea of sparsity yeah. and proportion and it's easier to get the idea of what it's going to look like in the water. Yeah. But yeah, I pounded my head against the wall and just stubbornly, I'm going to figure this out. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, obviously there wasn't the social media, you know, videos like we do have now today. Yeah. And, uh, some of these, you know, more experienced fly tires teaching their lessons. But did you have any sort of mentors growing up, I guess, um, other than, than your father that were in the industry that you kind of learned from, whether it was, you know, guiding or time? Um, was there anyone like that that you looked up to at the time? So, in terms of fly tying, I, when I got my act together and started following patterns, I was fortunate enough to take a tying class with Dick Talour when he was still with us. He's written many books on fly tying, very approachable guy, and I learned a couple things. Number one, what I was doing, generally speaking, was correct, but number two, there are easier ways to do it. So I had the right strategies, I had the right sense of proportion, but I would take too many thread wraps on something or I would put the wrap on last instead of first. So it was the last thing to come up the shank, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, the other thing I learned was there's there's more than one way to interpret something. There's more than one way to look at something. Someone can, someone can look at a fly and say, well, that imitates Bayfish X. Another person looks at it and says, no, that imitates a shrimp or something like that. So it's very, very subjective to people as well as the fish. So. <coughs> Excuse me. Another person, it was the International Fly Tying Symposium in 2001, just a couple months after 9-11. So people were going out trying to feel good about themselves and Bob Popovich was there and his book had just come out in 2001, so it was fresh. And I watched him tie and his tie patterns of serve candies and the silk clones, those were pretty revolutionary. Yeah. You know, it's only every decade or two that we get something that's really outside the box because there's only so many ways to tie something to a hook. And what impressed me about him was he had a crowd of people around him at his booth at his table. And he'd say, okay, what are, I, what are we tying? I said, how about a surf candy? And he tied it and he wouldn't let me leave him until he felt comfortable that I really understood what he had done. Yeah. So he wasn't just, you know, cranking flies out to satisfy people. He was really trying to pass on the knowledge appropriately. Yeah. And that's where it started. Now, now when I see him in shows, you know, we talk for a while and stuff like that. So these were like direct line relationships. They're kind of dotted line relationships, yeah. you know, where people influence me. And, and now I, I fish a lot with uh, Alan Kalo. He's the guy who literally wrote the book on sight fishing for striped bass. Yeah. He lives in Rhode Island in Connecticut. And sometimes we go out. Every time I'm out with him, I try to learn something from him. And he says he learned stuff from me, too. So, I mean, you know, the sight fishing game, which is my favorite, bass, redfish, bonefish, etc., all that cross train. When it comes to that, you have, like, the guy at the front of your boat in the ready position. It's just, it's just very, very surreal. Yeah. You know, and he, he, he's a friend. You know, I don't, is he a mentor? I guess he would fall in that category, but he's more of a buddy than a mentor. But you we guys sponge learn off from each other. Exactly, yeah. we sponge off of each other. Absolutely, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And that's perfect segue, kind of into more of your guiding career. Um, I guess when did you first begin guiding? Did you like it at first? I know some people can have mixed emotions when they yeah. start out. Um, I guess how did that? How did you get into the business? Yeah. So um, 
I had been living in Connecticut for probably 10 years and fishing the area for 10 years before I'd even considered guiding. Yeah. And I put this out there because I know of some people on social media who fish an area for a year or two, get their captain's license and think that makes them a guide. Yeah. That means you're licensed to drive a boat with a certain number of people and certain expectations. I would never even consider doing that. My, I don't have the ego that would make me think I know that. So then I started and it was basically word of mouth and 75% um, of my guys are return customers. And the reason for that is I'm very transparent. I'm not the kind of person who says, oh, you should have been here yesterday. They'll call or email and say, how's the fishing been? And I'll say, actually, you probably want to wait a couple of weeks. This hasn't been good. You know, wait for the next moon tide or something. And they really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, there have been some extremely high maintenance people on my boat. I make the best of it. They usually don't book with me again. I don't call them on their BS or anything, but you know, they just, I think part of it with a guide and a client is managing expectations. When I communicate with you and ask what your fly fishing experience is, you tell me you've been fly fishing for 20 years, that puts a certain expectation in my head in terms of your casting ability. But when you get on the boat and I find out that means once a year for 20 years, that's something completely different, you know what I mean? So, um, and I'm very transparent with them as well, you know what I mean? I'm not the guy if you want to go and fill up your cooler full of fish, I'm not your guide. Yeah. I strongly encourage catch and release. Um, there's ways we can kill slack tide. You know, if you want to get some pointers on your fly casting, I can do that. You know, then I help them learn about the environment around too. Historical landmarks on the islands and stuff like that. If there's seals playing or dolphins going by, we stop and we watch them. You know, so it's yeah. more immersive than just the fishing. But. Um, I haven't had what I would call really, really bad experiences with clients. I had some who would fall in the category of annoying or irritating because they think they know yeah. something. But uh, overall, they're really, really low maintenance people, which yeah. I really appreciate. Well, that's great to hear. Um, I know a major you know, factor in being a good guide is being educational and being a teacher uh, rather than you know just kind of get a fish on board. Right. Actually. Right. Making sure your clients can go back out the next day and do it themselves if that's what yeah. they're pleased to. Yeah. Um, and also building that trust in order to kind of secure those repeat clients, like you said. Um, very important, very important thing. So I guess going on, what are some of the key factors and steps you've taken in your career to build your own brand? Obviously, uh, you have a great reputation, very well known around your area. Um, Obviously, some of these things like building trust and being educational. Yes. What are some other key steps you've taken in your career to kind of build your own brand? And that, that's a great question. So the communication, mm -hmm. the transparency, um, managing expectations. From my perspective, that includes what I can and cannot do and the weather. I can't control the weather, but I can be realistic about opportunities. Um, I think since the age of the Internet, which is you know 25 years now or so, and social media, that's out there. But I don't think anything can really replace the face-to-face -face interaction, which is why I like to be at these shows, because you put a face to the name, or you know, in an email, you can't get context sometimes, or facial expressions, you know, and um, it doesn't always translate well, but I just, I, I think if you are true to yourself, and you have integrity, and it's word of mouth, I think it gets out there. I, I, I really do. And um, I'm friends with other guides in the area. And if I'm booked or if I'm unavailable, I send them to those guys and they reciprocate the exact same way. Because our areas that we guide are enormous. Yeah. I'm from Broughton, Connecticut, across to Montauk, all the way to Point Judith, Rhode Island, and as far east as the Connecticut River. That's thousands of square acres. And if we have some overlap, that's fine. Yeah. You know? So, um, I, I think if you just are real, if you're a genuine person, you know, stuff that you learned in the sandbox when you were a kid, you treat others the right way, right. they will reciprocate. And um, at the end of the day, it's just about catching fish. It's right. not life and death at the risk of sounding blasphemous, you know, it's just fishing. So uh, yeah. we're gonna keep that in mind too. No, those are, those are great things. People talk in this world and if you have a good reputation, it's going to get you a long way and yeah. vice versa. If you have a bad yeah. reputation, you're not going to make it very far. I agree. Um, so I guess, obviously you've been on both sides of being just a fisherman yourself and being a guide. How would you describe, you know, the feeling of catching a fish yourself versus putting a client, you know, on the biggest fish of their life or their first fish? That, that's a great question. And, um, 
I'm going to paraphrase because lots of people have said that anglers, regardless of what year they use, go through several stages in life. The stage number one, when you're young, you want to catch as many fish as possible. Then you want to catch the biggest fish possible. Then you want to catch the most difficult fish possible, permit or what have you. And then you just enjoy being out there and seeing other people succeed. That's where I am. That's where I am. So when I'm out there pulling people around and we're running around chasing fish or, you know, someone's fighting and, you know, I get to take a picture of them and text it to them and things like that, that's extremely gratifying. I mean, some days I'm out there, I'm like, I don't believe that people are paying me to do this because I'd be out here anyway. You know what I mean? And when other people are fishing, I can video dolphins or seals or birds and a blitz and things like that. And um, don't get me wrong, I still enjoy fishing for myself a great deal. I still selfishly go out on my own or with some friends sometimes. But um, if you keep pushing that passion into other people, especially when you have teenagers on the boat or you know people in their 20s and younger people that we need to replace some of the older generations as they pass on to care about the resource, it's very invigorating. I'd rather see someone else catch a 40 inch striper on my boat than me catch that fish at this point. Yeah. At this point. That's a beautiful thing about this sport. It's like you said, you evolve, you mature, you get to this place where you can pass that knowledge on to the next exactly. generation. Uh, which leads perfectly to my next question is, how have you seen the industry evolve since you first started up to this day? Um, obviously, social media <laughs> technology is slowly becoming a part of it. Um, well, what advice would you give to, I guess, the younger generation? So that's a great question. I was talking with some of the people over Fly Tires Row, some of us who have been doing this for a while. Instant gratification is not what you think it is. What I mean by that is you see someone caught a fish somewhere on a strong tide or at a river somewhere, you know where it is, and you go there because you saw them post about it. You catch fish there. Great. You put your picture up on Instagram or something. Great. How fulfilling is that experience to you compared to if you take it upon yourself, you learn a stretch of water, whether it's salt or fresh, you do the research, you put in the time, and you learn the patterns over the course of a season, year to year. If it's yeah. trout, you learn the hatches and the timing. If it's the salt, you learn you know, the tides and the migrations. And then you're not relying on someone else to know where to be. Boy, I hope this guy posts another picture so I know where to go where to fish next week. You know, you're you're drawing from experience. It's much, much deeper experience. So my advice would be, yes, it's good to see pictures here and there, but if you rely on that, you are not even scratching the surface of what this is really about. Because it's about connecting. And when I'm out on the water, not to sound too philosophical, but I feel like that's where I'm supposed to be. Whereas a lot of younger people, they're on the water, not because that's where they're supposed to be, because they want to get a picture out there for people to look at and say, oh, look how great that person is. Yeah. You know, people do it for a long time. They walk softly and carry a big stick and they don't have to brag. They have, you, know, you don't have, you shouldn't have anything to prove. You know what I mean? Right. So that's my advice. Experience and doing the hard work and the leg work mm -hmm. yourself. When you start getting the patterns and catching really good fish consistently, that is so gratifying. So gratifying. So yeah. focus on the experience. That, focus. That, that, that's the best advice I can give. Yeah. That's Take the, the time to learn yourself, yes. do your research, yes. study, and yes. the benefits are going to come along with that. Yes. Not necessarily, you know, looking for the success right off the bat, but really trying to ground yourself in the industry. Yeah. And, and I tell people when we're sight fishing, if you've never done this before, you may go hours without actually seeing a fish. Yeah. You may be checking out a new area on the wrong tide. You don't see anything, you assume it's a horrible area, but the next tide is flooded with fish. You have to have that success and failure. And if I caught fish every time I went out, I wouldn't fish. Yeah. I don't want it to be catching, I want it to be fishing. Otherwise it wouldn't be a challenge, it wouldn't be as fulfilling. Part of that challenge is what keeps people coming back. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the last thing I'd like to harp on here, Mark, is conservation, because it's something we really believe on yes. here in Go Guide. Yes. I um, mean, really something we need to make sure we pass on to the younger generation, as you're saying, taking care of, you know, the waters that provide so much for us. Um, a lot of these guys obviously depend on these waters for their business and for their life, and um, we need to make sure we take care of them. So I know that you're a conservationist. I guess what are some steps that people can take that you've taken uh, to really make sure that we're taking care of? You know, that's great. I think, uh... <coughs> Excuse me. I think that we need to think beyond ourselves. I think we need to remember that although we are 
from an evolution standpoint, we're at the top. We rely on the lower levels of the ecosystem, the lower trophic levels. And I think COVID showed something when people stopped driving and when people stopped using boats and stuff, water's cleared up, fish returned. I just think, it, think globally, but act locally. I, that's kind of cliche to some people, but I think it really matters. Um, I catch and release. I strongly encourage catch and release. I tell people, don't mistake locally hot fishing to be representative of the fishery as a whole. Because some people in one zone will say, oh, you know, the fishing's horrible. And some people 100 miles away say, oh, it's red hot, the best season we've ever had. That doesn't mean that either one of them is completely representative of the fishery. Yeah. Take care of the bait, take care of the environment, educate younger people, get young people involved, try to keep them involved. Uh, don't have to be a tree hugger or anything, but if, if, if you can just make conscious decisions, I, I think that's a start. Of course. Try and not to be pessimistic. It's really easy to say, oh, it's too late, we can't do anything. Because that will guarantee failure. Yeah. It's the most important thing, you know, preserving this land that has provided so much for us. Is, I agree. It's the most important factor of keeping sure this industry is alive. I agree. Um, well, that's, uh, that's all I got for you, Mark. Thank you very much for talking Thanks. with us today. Um, obviously, we love having you here at Go Guide. It's been a pleasure working with you, and we hope to have many more years in the future going Thank forward. Thank you. I feel the same. Um, but, yeah, that's all I got. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Mark. Appreciate it.